Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for Workday Chats. I'm Katie Coletto. I'll be your host today for this great discussion with four really amazing thought leaders that are joining us. If you have any questions, please share them in the comments below. So today I'm joined by Patrick Cornier, Chief Evangelist at Pecan, a Workday company, Jeff Douglas, talent and transformation partner and global center of competency for skills and talent transformation at IBM. That's a mouthful. Uh, Christina Galt, our general manager of talent optimization here at Workday, and Kevin Martin, who is the chief research officer at the Institute for Corporate Productivity, which is more com commonly known as I4CP. So we are so excited to have this conversation with you today to discuss the future of skills which is near and dear to all of our hearts and how HR and recruitment leaders are focusing on skills throughout the employee journey. So I'd like to start um, by talking about the World Economic Forum and they predict that by 2025, not too far in the future, we'll see 85 million jobs displaced and 97 million new jobs created. So many of those new roles are gonna require brand new skills. The Institute, excuse me, the Institute for Corporate Productivity recently conducted research on workforce readiness and assessing whether organizations currently have the skills and capabilities that are necessary to really advance their own strategies over the next one to three years in light of all the changes going on in the skills universe. So I'd like to start with you, Kevin, and see if you could share some of those key findings from this research. Thanks, Katie. It's exciting to be here. Um, let me just share this, that uh, the, the study, which was global, we were really excited about it. Unfortunately, it paints a very dismal picture. So, and, and this is really, really important to frame up because, you know, right now, there are headlines abounding around supply chain issues, right? They talk about how our holiday gifts are stuck off the shore in Long Beach, California in container ships, for instance, or how my family's Apple phones uh, may not work if we buy a new one or it's going to take forever because semiconductor chips, you know, you can't get one. And, you know, it has so many ramifications. But here's the thing. So many organizations need to start thinking about probably the most important aspect of their supply chain, and that's their talent supply chain. And what our research found is that most organizations don't know what they've got, they don't know what they need, and they don't have a plan to go about bridging that gap. And it's really, really frightening when you consider that right now, this is according to a webinar that I was a part of uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, over a thousand people answered this poll. And we said, to what extent are you currently experiencing a talent exodus? 69% said a moderate to high degree of talent exodus they're currently experiencing right now. Now, one last thing, Katie, and this really makes this um, problem, this talent supply chain problem, all the more important and scary. You just referenced the World Economic Forum's uh, Future of Jobs report, which is a great report. That same report states that 50% of the world's employees are going to need reskilling by the year 2025. Well, what our global research on workforce readiness found, and we had respondents from 55 countries, is that only 12% of organizations, and these are organizations with over 1,000 employees, only 12% view their upskilling and reskilling initiatives as effective. Pretty daunting stuff. Wow. So that means 88% of people have, or organizations have quite a way to go on this. So I hope everybody- Great opportunity, yes. <laughs> it's a great opportunity and a, a very, very timely discussion for us. So let's dive in and talk about, you know, what practices might be applicable to help organizations address this growing skills gap and, and really get ready and build that workforce readiness across their organization. Um, so Christina, let's start with you. Yeah, Katie, I'm really delighted to be here. And, uh, you know, skills definitely near and dear to, to my heart. And, and when we think about skills and skill based practices, that's really the biggest shift that we've seen in people practices in decades. 
And so, you know, it's, it's something we've been trying to address for a long time. And, and really, I think how we get to understanding uh, how we address the skills gap and build workforce readiness. And when we look at our customers, we see that they're all at different stages uh, of that journey. And, and it's a transformation journey for them. And I think uh, to get started, uh, they really have to define a strategy or plan. So Kevin, to your point, you know, they don't have a plan, nor do they know what they have. So they have to, you know, come up with or, or begin to plan for that strategy. And really essential to that is understanding the capabilities of their workforce, so understanding what they have. So really getting to that single source of truth uh, for skills data. And that lays the foundation to then provide insights so that then they can look to, uh, uh, to make decisions based on the information that they have. So understanding what they have so that then they can figure out, okay, now what do I need? So where's my gap? And then figuring out, like, I got to make decisions as to whether I build, buy, or borrow, and using that data to, to do that. And then ultimately, I think it's really infusing, and, and again, I, I make these sound like best practices, like you can do them like tomorrow, right? They're all pretty big, uh, you know, getting to infusing really skills throughout the life cycle, like using that to optimize all the different areas and, and make those decisions that I just talked about. Yep, exactly. And I guess maybe going to a practitioner, Jeff, on infusing these skills across the life cycle, is that something that you're looking at in the COC? with IBM and transformation strategy. Absolutely. And, and first off, let me just say thank you for including me in this conversation. I think it's really exciting. Love this topic. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really critical one for so many of the organizations that we work with. When we talk to clients, oftentimes we're talking about them in the context of some form of disruption that they're facing or they're you know, dealing with in their business, whether that be strategic or technology or, or talent. Um, you know, in many respects, the global pandemic was the ultimate disruptor, right? If you think about the impact it had on individuals, as well as the immediate impact it had on businesses in terms of the way they work and the adjustments that they had to make. And so when we talk to the client, our clients about those kinds of disruptors, we've really focused on three pillars that help them navigate their way through it. Christine has already spoken to one of them, which is that idea of transparency. Can you articulate where you are today? And Kevin referenced this as well, where you are today and where you need to go using a common language and skills becomes that common language. Once you have that, the second pillar we speak to them about is agility, the ability to move with speed and confidence uh, in the direction that you need to go. Because once you understand where you are and where you need to go, and you do that in a common way, it's easier to you know, identify the skills of your workforce, identify the gaps you need to close and begin to work towards where you're, where you're headed. That agility and that transparency then leads to the third pillar, which is a critical pillar, which is engagement. You know, Any kind of transformational work, any kind of transformational effort is only going to be sustained if your employees are engaged. And that becomes an even more critical piece of this, given the climate that we're in, the difficult job market. We've seen a number of instances where a, a client's been in the process of a, a transformation and they've effectively been stopped in their tracks because they can't find the talent they need to move forward. And so the ability to understand where it is in your organization, what kind of talent you can grow, how you can get there, becomes a really critical piece of, of that exercise. So that's the, those are the phases, kind of the best practices we tend to work with our clients on. And speaking of, what? <laughs> speaking Another of- Another panelist. <laughs> employees, uh, I know Patrick perked up and I'll go on mute for a second while the dog barks. But Patrick, uh, how do you bring employees along on this ride? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, to tag on to what Jeff was just saying, you know, engagement is the core of what we do at Pecan and that's what inspires us every day. And uh, a big part of um, sustainable growth initiatives, which is really, you know, skills is obviously incredibly connected with growth and uh, employees really want to have individualized growth plans and journeys. We, we have seen that uh, particularly over the past 18 months, how important that is for employees and how, it, how important it will be in the future for organizations to be uh, competitive in the market and in the landscape uh, to really have individualized plans for employees. So listening to employees uh, is incredibly important for any type of sustainable long-term initiatives when it comes to growth. Uh, and also empowering employees to 
understand what each employee is capable of and what they eventually want to be capable of. I think those are two aspects that are important as organizations are thinking about uh, defining how they empower skills within their organizations is really understanding what each individual employee needs and wants and then empowering those employees to be able to reach those goals. And it seems that one of the challenges with that would be doing that at scale. Yes. How do you do that? Yes. <laughs> with thousands of employees, with also right. with expectations continuing to evolve and organizations needing to be incredibly agile to meet those evolving and fast-paced change of expectations with employees. We've seen employee expectations grow, the speed and the pace of employee expectations change uh, significantly over the past two years. And, and I really, I don't think that pace is going to slow down anytime soon. Agree. So as we, you know, think about enterprises or organizations moving to the skills-based strategy, We've got, you know, certainly know what we need to do, but what are some of the benefits um, to kind of going skills first in your approach to talent and workforce planning and, and your strategic direction? Um, thoughts on that? Maybe, Jeff, do you want to start with that one? Uh, sure. So I think it really does build on what we've talked about so far, this idea of the importance of transparency and the ability to move with confidence and be agile and engage, right? Because mm -hmm. especially in the market that we're in today and the environment that we're in today, it, it becomes even more critically important to be able to engage, just as Patrick said, to be able to engage and retain your employees. And so from an organizational standpoint, the ability to have a better view into the skills of your organization and be able to connect that view to whether it be succession planning, workforce planning, uh, or some of the other elements of transformation that they're driving to uh, is gonna promote you know, better internal mobility, uh, better approaches to things like succession planning, planning and workforce planning. Um, and from a just an overall benefit perspective, ROI perspective, what you'll see is better retention, um, you know, redu reductions in project delays, overall cost of hiring reducing. The other thing, if you sort of flip the script and you think about this from an employee perspective, that transparency uh, becomes critical to driving you know, engagement. And what we almost uh, often will talk about inspiration, right? Go beyond engagement to actually inspiring, right? Getting them committed because that drives productivity. It drives retention. You know, Patrick, you sort of spoke to it just a few minutes ago, but you know, what we found is the demographic today uh, of employees is there's almost a, a social contract that's part of it, right? It's not just about what I can do for you as a company, but what are you doing to invest in me? What are you doing to help me get better? and contribute and be a part of what's happening. And that social contract becomes a critical piece of helping them to stay engaged with the organization. And so this, this transparency piece really helps with that significantly. Absolutely. And, and I know, Christina, at Workday, we talk a lot about uh, skills and how skills contribute to experience um, of the employees. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, to to, uh, to reiterate some of the things that you said, uh, Jeff, where uh, really when we think about growth and mobility and learning, right, those are the key things that we hear again and again as to reasons people look outside their organization. So that and and that expectation is that that is there, and if you can provide that and skills, you know, gaining new skills really allow you to to I would say unlock that potential. Uh, it, it, that you have in your organization. And, and it's that visibility, right? The visibility to the individual and then to the organization. So it's a win-win, right? For on, on both sides, where for the employee, it does you know, increase their satisfaction, al allows you to really to build that continuous learning uh, culture and that mindset, um, allows you to, to have that agility and speed at the end of the day um, where, where they have that. And then for the, for the organization, it's that organization agility because now you're able to, if we think about work today, it's no longer looking at just jobs and roles, right? It's, it's what's the body of work and, and what, what do we need to do to make that happen? And so it, it, when you're matching, you know, it, it skills is the way to match people to opportunity. 
uh, really allows you to operate with that organizational agility. So I, I think all around it, it, uh, it, it unlocks that agility, that ingenuity and creativity and that, and that productivity. And then to a point that you made earlier, Jeff, on um, just when we look at the last year and everything that happened, there's also an element of future proofing here. Where, where people are gaining skills so they're feeling prepared to tackle whatever else uh, comes next. So, uh, you know, so much, I, I guess I could go on and on about, about what, we, <laughs> what we could do with, uh, with skills here, but, uh, but I do think that skills first approach uh, really will benefit us. And, and, and ultimately that transparency adds to really more inclusive talent pools. I think about skills-based hiring. Uh, that's that's the other other piece I think that that's really important to to put here. Inclusivity becomes uh, with that transparency. Yeah, and I think Christina, you talk about you know building new skills increases the ability to actually um, or accelerates the ability to continue building new skills. So building that muscle as a worker or as an employee becomes really a new critical piece of of engagement in an organization and. And I wonder if Kevin, will this impact the, I can't remember the percentage, 60%, 69% of the, of the organizations who are having uh, challenges with retention? Well, I definitely believe that's the case. I, I couldn't agree more with what Jeff and, and uh, Christina just outlined. And I'll, I'll build on that a little bit, Katie. You know, the, I'll get to the engaged or to that, to that retention piece in just a minute, but there's really three things that just from our research really stand out just in thinking about a skills first approach. One is something that Christina mentioned, and I don't think enough companies place enough weight on this right now. And that is, it forces you to look at the work that needs to get done mm -hmm. in the, your firm. Too many leaders and too many processes are constrained when they think about roles and people within roles do certain things, but there's so much trapped value within every individual and every organization. And when you think about a skills first approach, the first thing it's gonna force you to do as an organization is to think, what is the work that's critical that we must continue to do? How will that work be augmented? What work is not going to be critical? going forward. And that allows you to start thinking about, wow, well, where does automation or outsourcing or other things fit in with regard to that? What type of work is going to be new? And what capabilities are required around that? That's the deconstruction of work that John Bedreau, and we've done a ton of research with John, has been talking mm -hmm. for decades. And our research really validates that. And John partners with us on a lot of our research. But this allows you to really start disaggregating roles into the work components. The second piece to Christina's point on the individual and what Jeff was referencing as well, you know, when you think about that trapped value, you know, so much, you know, and, and, and uh, Patrick was talking about engagement, et cetera. You know, everyone's got their own definition of engagement, but let's just say that one is, you know, the discretionary effort that they want to put forth into the firm, right? Think about the discretionary effort and, and work and home and, and everything else is ubiquitous anymore. But, you know, can you as a firm, by having such a meaningful purpose, but also being able to provide work opportunities, job opportunities that capitalize on the interests and the capability, the passions of the workforce, both current and future, and, and how can you better align to that? It just, it just automatically is going to have a better effect on overall engagement and retention and, out, and productivity, et cetera. The last thing I'll mention though, I think this is really, really important is once you're able to disaggregate the roles into the work components and you start being able to mix and match and allow workers to match themselves to opportunity in the business to find you know, talent and workers that, that, that lend best to the opportunities of the business or the needs of the business, it forces you to reimagine your talent supply chain, going back to the talent mm -hmm. chain piece earlier. And so many organizations need to start thinking about where can I find skills and capability 
outside of our traditional full-time equivalent hiring or outsource or getting from our MSP, if you would, but where can we exchange talent with people within our ecosystem, like partners mm -hmm. or, or primary customers? How can we in rotational assignments to really purposefully connect people across our enterprise to bridge silos? How can we provide opportunities from an exposure standpoint so that this really high potential talent who's hidden here, who happens to not have anyone that they look like or really can associate with, but they can build a relationship with a sponsor who's really, really essential in providing them that sponsorship going up. I mean, all of a sudden it just blows up the way you're traditionally thinking about talent and where you get talent from and skills and capabilities. So there's that's a big long-winded answer, but there's so much there to unpack. Well, it's such, I love your idea of trapped value and thinking about trapped value, not only in your own workforce, but in your entire ecosystem and how to unlock that and use it. And it, it makes talent planning and talent development just completely different and, and super, super exciting. Um, and, and daunting maybe for some, uh, which maybe we could think about technology and how technology could help that challenge of, of unlocking value, unlocking talent. Um, Kevin, maybe since you're in a, a research uh, mode, do you see, you know, what do you see around the use of technology based on skills or how technology is impacting that direction that we're taking? Well, there's a lot of area for improvement there. We're taking <laughs> half full approach today, folks. Um, the, the research clearly- well, You're talking to the right people. <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, listen, we all, HR, as we all know, is the most complex function in any organization. And they have pulled yeoman's work beyond any imagination over the last 18 months. And uh, how they do what they're doing is beyond a lot of people's comprehension. And hopefully more boards recognize the contribution that HR brings to the table. The, what we're getting at, how, what I'm getting at here, however, is that the research clearly shows that most organizations, I think it's only about a third of organizations really are, are really um, spending time and, and, and flexing some muscle around looking at the work that needs to get done and being able to say, how does automation fit into that equation? What work needs to be augmented? What work needs to be automated? And you know, how do we go about you know, uh, developing our people, especially in the augmentation piece, to really work with the technology in that uh, regard? So there's tremendous opportunity there. But I would also say, Katie, and I think we can't lose track of it, and I'll just throw this one in there, is you know, in this age, uh, you know, we all know that work has been forever altered. And um, there is so much more work that's going to be done remote and hybrid, blended, you name it, whatever vernacular you want to use. But the ability for leaders, people leaders, team leaders um, to be able to leverage technology, to engage, to collaborate, to, um, to purposely create those water cooler or serendipitous social connected moments, if you would, because innovation does not require in person. It doesn't. Collaboration doesn't require in person, but there are times when you want to get people together, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is in this real world or this new age world, leaders have got to be good, digitally savvy people when it comes to leveraging technology. Leaves us all speechless. Yes. And, and <laughs> I think thinking about leaders and managers and tapping into technology, you know, maybe we start at the employee level and, and Patrick, you know, thinking about how managers tap into technology to get that, um, that voice of their employees and yeah. voices, speaking of voices of puppies in the background. <laughs> uh, thanks. And, and Kevin, I have to say, uh, I personally am inspired by your passion and energy talking about this because it's it's great. And I could not agree with you more about the importance of empowering 
leaders and managers within organizations to use technology to their advantage. Uh, and we have seen many, many organizations embracing different types of technology, uh, particularly over the past year and a half, as you said, the world of work has, has changed and uh, is changed for the future. Um, we know that uh, two key drivers of engagement uh, are growth and meaningful work. And being able to understand not only at an organizational level, but leaders being able to understand how their teams are experiencing different growth programs, uh, initiative initiatives within organizations that, quite frankly, organizations are going to need to, to invest in uh, new programs, new ways of tapping into these skills and developing their employees moving forward to retain their employees. Christina, you brought up a really good point around retention and this idea around growth, not only being a key driver of engagement, but also we find and we know that employees show a declining level of satisfaction with growth in different ways, personal growth, mentoring within the organization, their experience with their own individual learning journeys, uh, and also their career path. We see from a data perspective, there is a specific decline with employees satisfaction around how they experience growth within an organization up to nine months before they even leave their companies. So the fact that we can have a technology to listen to employees, to empower organizations to understand how effective the growth programs that they're implementing are across their organization in pockets of their organization. But then also, I think even more importantly for managers to understand how are my, how is my team or my, how are my teams? Uh, what is their level of satisfaction with growth? And, and in turn, meaningful work, because the two are very connected. So I think that embracing technology to be able to, to give us those insights and then be able to take meaningful action based off of those insights uh, is in incredibly critical. So having technology to be able to continuously listen to employees and understand how their employees, how employees are uh, experiencing and their level of satisfaction around growth and meaningful work, I think is critically important for the future. And what a difference from the days of the annual employee survey. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Getting or, results three months later. Or the, just the, the, well, you know, my, my gut tells me this, right. Or like, Oh no, I, I know. I talk to my team all the time. Like I know how they feel or I don't, I know what they think. Like it's, it's, the employee voice has never been more important. And also employees have never wanted to have their voice heard more than they do today. And that is an incredibly inspiring uh, idea, I think, for the workplace, for HR. You're talking about the, the role of HR, but also for frontline leaders to know that their employees want to have their voice heard. Employees want to be part of the strategic decisions of organizations moving forward, what an opportunity for every organization to be able to include their employees, the most valuable asset in the future that they're building. So I think it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity ahead of all of us. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, if we think about transformation, Jeff, how are you seeing companies moving in this direction? Um, are you, seeing this digital fluency increasing with the managers, with the executives and, and taking advantage of these technologies? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And, and I think um, I'll, I'll speak to that one in just a second, but what I do want to just piggyback on, on what Patrick just described about the importance of that employee uh, and, and, and uh, engagement and, and making sure that they feel a part of things. Um, the example I'll offer is we're actually engaged with a Fortune 100 company right now. And, and we, the way we're engaged with them is they're going through a cloud transformation. They're literally moving over 700 applications to the cloud over the course of three years. And you can imagine not just the technical work involved, but the impact that has on ways of working and new operating models. Mm -hmm. And what's most interesting about it is 
you can imagine that if they think about the contractual commitments that they asked us to um, to step up to, you can think of things like, you know, reducing operating costs and, and productivity and speed to market and things like that. No, the first one on their list was a 30% increase in employee engagement. That was the first thing on their list of contractual commitments to us because they recognized the, the level of change going through the organization and the importance of bringing everybody along and the challenge that was going to be in front of them to do that. So just a real, you know, I, I, it, mm -hmm. you talked about inspiring Patrick and I agree, Kevin, the passion with which you're talking about this stuff, absolutely. But it's those kinds of interactions that make you feel like, yeah, we're, we're in the right place. We're trying to do the right things here by, by the folks. So, so back to your, back to your question on, on the technology piece of this, you know, we'll often talk to the clients about the fact that, you know, we often use that hockey analogy that you've heard before, right? The puck's always moving, right? Mm -hmm. So the best players are moving in the direction of where the puck is going as opposed to where it is. Yep. Now, what's interesting about that is, you know, in the context of the rate of change that we're seeing, the transient nature of skills, it's not a matter of looking one step ahead. It's a matter of looking a couple steps ahead. Because if you get to that one point and stop, you're going you're gonna to be falling behind. And, but that's difficult because you never know where disruption is going to come from. You never kind of know what's next. It becomes a really challenging problem to have that foresight to move forward. And, and certainly, how do you do that at scale? And that's where things like AI and machine learning can help augment these processes and help provide patterns and sift through volumes and volumes of data to help identify patterns and cohorts and insights that help drive the agility and the ability to move forward. Uh, I'll give you an example from IBM's perspective. So IBM itself went through a major transformation uh, starting in around 2014 around a shift towards a business model around AI and cloud. Um, and that impacted our entire, our entire organization. And, and back to what we talked about at the very beginning of our, our discussion, this idea of understanding where you are, well, one of the first things we had to do was understand where our workforce was. What skills that our workforce have? IBM has over 350,000 people. And so you can imagine the idea of traditional approaches of, well, let's just send an email out to everybody and ask them to comment on their skills and all that sort of thing. <laughs> it's not going to work, right? But beyond the volume challenge of it and the timeliness challenge of it, it, it introduces a level of subjectivity and, and bias. And you know, depending on the mood I'm in that day or level of cynicism I had toward that exercise, it's all going to sort of you know, uh, influence those results. What we did is we introduced uh, a capability, an AI-driven capability that we call skills inference that basically looked at the employee's digital footprint. And we certainly, you know, were very sensitive to privacy as part of that, but it looked at that digital footprint in, in their work. And then off of that, used AI to create an initial view of their skills that we presented back to the employees and allowed them to then validate it and take ownership of it. And so it was, it's a great example of how AI can help accelerate, scale, and really sustain these kinds of transformations that, that we're all trying to work through in, in many of our organizations. So. Yeah, I think Jeff makes a really great point on the technology where I don't think we would be able to, we wouldn't be where we are today in terms of where we can sift through all that data and actually have these skill-based practices if we didn't have the technology, right? And that technology continues to evolve and helps us to, to actually solve the data problem, uh, do the inference, right? To, to take the data that you have and use it to make sure that you're building profiles uh, and, and making that easy and in the flow of what you're doing, right? So the data across your people to be able to, to do that. So then you can actually use it and optimize uh, throughout. So, that, so uh, it's not a small point that, that um, the technology really is going to help us, you know, get to that, to that readiness and, and we do need to embrace it. And we're fortunate, right? That we're at this point. Cause I, I think if we look back to practices in the past, mm. like, you know, the, the whole story of building a skills taxonomy and how long that would take. And, uh, and then the minute it's done, it's, it's, it's limited, right? And it's dated, you know, where we know that they'll continue to change. You know, Kevin, you shared the, the data in terms of the, the rate of change. And Katie, I think you mentioned it right at the top. So uh, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's critical really for, for us to be successful. So if we look at the technology and, and the enablement that that technology brings us today, which is amazing because we can actually make this shift. Um, and everybody on the panel, get out your crystal balls. What skills do we think are going to be most, most critical as we move into the future? Um, Christina, from a, from a workday perspective where we're growing like crazy, what are you seeing? 
Yeah, no, I think, um, uh, as you said, crystal ball, like, it, you know, whatever we say today, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a few weeks from now, tomorrow. Uh, different. Uh, but, but I do think, um, you, you know, really human skills where what we used to call, what we've called soft skills, right, uh, mm -hmm. are, are, are going to be very, very important or continue to be very important. Um, and I think even the ones that, you know, we talked about leadership. And, and the skills that help us to, to, to be leaders, to help champion change, to help, uh, you know, guide us through, through things that are happening. So when I think about them, I'll just, I'll just call them out in no particular order. Collaboration and communication, I think, is, is really, really important. Um, innovative thinking, uh, I think, also very important. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, for, for many of, of, of our customers and what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to, to facilitate change and make things happen. So the ability to execute. Uh, is, is I think the other thing that uh, um, uh, I would call out. And, and again, I, I, I know that others have, have, uh, have their ideas, so, so I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Anyone else want to take a shot at what your crystal ball might be telling us? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in because um, I'll build right off of what Christina just mentioned. It's, um, I want to frame the issue around this because I'm going to take it down two different paths here. So the issue, let's say that the issue is building on what Jeff, Patrick, and Christina have been talking about in you, Katie. We live amidst a, an environment of continuous change and disruption. And mm -hmm. the goal is no longer to manage change, it's to manage amid change. That's really the mindset shift, right? Mm -hmm. Our research clearly, clearly, clearly shows that you know, when leaders embrace change, it has a very strong correlation to overall business outcomes as well as the ability to have a workforce that is very ready, ready for the future, and an organization that's able to anticipate, adapt, and act on change, agility. I mean, it's just off the charts important. Christina mentioned collaboration is really important. I will double down on that and e actually go even more narrow. What raise you one? With leaders. <laughs> Pardon me, Katie? And you're going to raise her one? You're going to raise me one. I will raise Katie <laughs> one. Yeah. And I'm horrible at gambling, so get ready. I'm going to lose all my money here, but uh, the point's going to be made well. So the what our research found, and we've done extensive research with Professor Rob Cross, who uh, at Babson College on collaboration, it is so clear to us that it's not just collaboration skills. Leaders have got to be very purposeful collaborators and connectors. And, and I want to zero in on the purposeful word. What that basically means is very intentional because everyone's suffering from collaboration overload right now. Hmm. So the, intentional, the purposeful piece is being able to, it's, it's leaders who have been trained in purposeful collaboration are really attuned to who really needs to be in these meetings versus who doesn't. When a meeting happens, is there a defined agenda? Uh, when a meeting occurs, are there defined decision rights authority assigned to that meeting? Because it can change all the time, but it just it just makes it so much more effective. And so, and and the purposeful connector pieces start to think about the silos in the organization and what type of connections people need to break down silos to establish strong connections and exposure and building that into rotational assignments and other developmental pieces. Now, the other thing I'll mention is this, we conducted research earlier this year on, uh, uh, we've known for the last decade that the way a definition of a leader has been redefined. And is, so we all know that it's not so much about the what, in other words, what they accomplish, but how they go about accomplishing the what. And mm -hmm. so, what I would want to just stress is we looked at close to 70 leadership behaviors and five stood out as being the most impactful. And I'm just going to mention one of them is that purposeful connector and collaborator. But another one I'll mention, and this really hits upon where Jeff and Patrick were going, is around the empathy, the empathy and the understanding piece. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll mention is just um, the ability to embrace change. And the reason I'm suggesting this is not so much for train people on the ability to embrace change. It's more of, can you identify those within your organization at all types of levels? Those who are resistors, you've got to be able to break through. But if they are, do they really need to be in your succession pipe anymore? Do they really need to be those mm. managing lots of 
of, of, of people who are high potentials and want to have different exposure and movement, I would question that in a big way. Um, and so I would just mm. you know, put that up for consideration. Interesting. I just want to add one quick thing to that, Kevin, because mm -hmm. you, you were talking about change just now. And one other uh, area that I think is quite important to look at from a skills perspective with change is also, I, I feel there's going to be a significant need for everyone in an organization to be able to either handle, deal with, handle uh, ambiguity within an organization. Because mm -hmm. something over the past 18 months that has been presented to everyone is that there's a significant amount of ambiguity. There has been, and that can be a very uncomfortable space for a lot of people. And with the pace of change, the, the rate that we're going to see change continue over the next two to three years, I do think a, a skill that is going to be important is how do we handle a environment that, that could be, uh, that could include a, a significant amount of ambiguity as we build our journey forward. So I think that's mm -hmm. the one addition uh, of the skill that I think we should keep our eye on. That's such an important, and, you just brought up Patrick. And maybe that, maybe that speaks to something we've seen in our research. What we found is the most popular skill set among the general workforce that organizations believe they need to be developing over the next one to three years is complex problem solving. And mm -hmm. I think that there is an element of dealing with ambiguity in that. And there's also an element of where so many organizations just don't have muscle right now is in analytical skills. And so the, the ability to process multiple inputs coming in all different types of directions, mm -hmm. including stuff where you're like, this, we don't even know what this is, but, but we're sensing this probably speaks to that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I, I'll just quickly add, I couldn't agree more with, with everything Kevin and Patrick and Christine have described, but let me, let me also comment on the technical side from a skills perspective as well, right? I mean, at the end of the day, so much of the change that we see is often around a shift towards digital. I talked about the client that's going through the cloud transformation now. And so, you know, obviously being able to ensure that your organization and everyone in your organization has the right requisite skills to support those kinds of transformation becomes important. And, and the, there's two points I would make, uh, and they're really with an eye towards what I would describe as future proofing. I think Patrick, you had talked about that earlier. So the first of those is, you know, we think about something like cloud transformation and all the skills that are associated with that. We often think of that as a technical exercise. So it's important that people can write the code, they can do this, they can support the operation and things like that. But the reality is a transformation like that impacts everyone in the organization. It changes legal and how you think about risk. It changes go to market. It changes your support function. And so well, from an organizational standpoint, when you think about that set of digital or technical skills that support that, the importance of thinking holistically throughout your organization around how it impacts every single function within your organization, every, everybody within that function is really, really important. And then the second thing I'll, I'll suggest is being able to look at technical skills and recognize that there are certain skills that are more transient in nature. If you think about programming languages, Java, R, C++, Ruby on Rails, right? Those are the languages we might need today. Well, tomorrow it's something else. And so that's not to say that you don't need to ensure that people have those specific skills because they're essential to where you're going today, but coupling those with some of the skills we've already talked about that make up a good developer become really important, right? So I don't, I don't only need someone that can code in Java, but they have to have problem solving skills. They have to have organizational skills. They have to have communication. And if you bring that together as a holistic view from a profile perspective of an individual, then you've got someone that when that game changes and when that puck moves away from Java to the next thing, the likelihood you can take that individual and grow them into the next role and shift them to where you're headed and they're engaged in that process becomes much higher. So from a technical perspective, those are the, the, sort of the angles I would suggest people ought to be thinking about those. Yep, super interesting. And I, and I think I would add one more just from a management and leadership perspective is being skilled at skills. And I, I think that idea of 
reskilling and understanding how to manage in this whole new world of skills is going to be a skill um, that will be in demand. So I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. I think this was just a really great thought provoking conversation. Uh, I hope those of you listening to us today have enjoyed it as much as we have. It's always so nice to sit in a virtual room with so many great minds um, coming together. So I really, really appreciate it and wonder if anyone has any kind of parting thoughts on how our listeners can start embracing this skills journey that we're on. How about I'll go to Kevin first. Any quick thoughts? I, I, I would just suggest start small. You don't have to, get, this is so much change is happening out there. You know, there's an advantage to being able to say, where do we place the most critical bets? I would really, on the skills piece, I would really zero in and say, what are the critical roles in our organization right now that absolutely would put, just put a halt to our achieving of whatever? How are those going to augment themselves? You know, I, I think, Katie, of, you know, there's a hospital system. I won't name the, 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 the system. 120,000 healthcare workers. They were facing a major issue when it came to uh, nurse attrition. And this is over the last year or so. And they basically talked to the nurses, to Patrick's point, major listening strategies. They knew why the attrition was happening. And they, and it was all about the nurses were le- working so much of their work was below the certificate level of their, of their nursing certificate, if you would, their credentials. And mm-hmm. they aggregated that role into the work that was being done by the nurses. And they took all the stuff that was more administrative below certificate. And they said, we, and they outsourced it. They put it out to junior level people for development. They augmented it in different ways and it allowed the nurses to work above certificate. Engagement went up, retention went up, patient satisfaction went up. Start small, focus in on the critical roles. Love it. Yeah, yeah. I might just, I, just add there that, you know, get started. You know, if you haven't started, a good one. Start. <laughs> get, get started and then, you know, embrace technology, right? That, that we, we are at a point where it, it can help us uh, do these things and do these things at scale. And so, so I, I would say um, get started and embrace technology. Yeah. And I, I think I would, I would uh, add that, you know, it's, it's as important to be able to start as it is to sustain. And, and so Understanding that there are multiple dimensions to these kinds of shifts, uh, cultural and organizational and different behavioral changes. Identifying a change network within the organization that can champion this work becomes really, really important. The right mixture of leadership and individuals that are bought in. So to Christina's point, getting started and embracing technology, that can be challenging for people. There can be yeah. trust issues and things of that nature. So having, having a core group that is sort of all in and, and can champion it, can communicate out about it, can be full participants and really speak to the value as it's growing is essential to how you grow the thing over time. Kate, I'll just say one last quick thing. We know that growth is a key driver of engagement with employees. So uh, we need to understand how initiatives are impacting our employees, how they are, uh, their level of satisfaction with it and expectation from employees around growth are going to continue to grow. <laughs> Speaking of growth, but they are going to continue to grow. So we need to stay ahead of the curve and listen to our employees to understand what we need to do to build the most effective growth programs for them. Excellent. So much great advice around the room. And I appreciate and thank you so much for sharing your insights. And for those of you joining us today, please join us again for the next episode of Workday Chats. Thank you. Have a great day.